Hello and welcome to the lunchtime seminar series of the Geography Department at Trinity College Dublin. My name is Tommy Gavin and I'm a PhD candidate here in the department uh, and I'll be chairing today's session. Uh, please note that the seminar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the departmental communications channels in the next couple of days. But today we're joined by Professor Nigel Roulet, Chair of the Department of Geography at McGill University in Montreal, Canada and Fellow of the Academy of Science at the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, Professor Relay's work investigates, among other things, the interactions between climate, hydrology, and ecosystem structure and function, which determine the biogeochemistry of the gaseous exchanges between ecosystems and the atmosphere, and lateral water exchanges between ecosystems within catchments. Uh, but today, Professor Relay's talk will address the differences between Irish and Canadian peatlands and the possible impacts of climate change and of land use changes such as extraction, restoration, and inadvertent disturbance. Uh, the presentation will take about 40 minutes and then we'll open it to the floor for a question and answer discussion. Uh, we ask that you please mute your microphones and hold your questions until that time and I'll then group questions from the floor if we have a cascade of interventions. Otherwise, I'll try to mediate the passing of the proverbial microphone for more direct questions. But with that, it is my great honour to introduce here now Professor Nigel Roulet. Thank you very much, Tommy. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, it is 8 a.m. here in, uh, in Montreal, um, and uh, the backdrop that you see behind me is not Montreal. This is actually from the deck of our cottage on Lake Huron, uh, one of the great, uh, great lakes. So, right, I'm going to talk, talk to you about peatlands and greenhouse gases and the consequences of uh, land use and, and uh, climate change. Um, let's see if I can advance. Yeah. So I just want to point out that uh, it's uh, fortuitous that I'm doing the presentation today because it's February 2nd, which is World's Wetland, World Wetland Day. And uh, so there's a lot of initiatives out there on conservation of wetlands. And the, what I'm going to be talking about peatlands are a type of wetland. I also want to point out to you that it's also Groundhog Day. I don't know whether you celebrate Groundhog Day in Ireland or not, but we do certainly here in North America. Uh, in Ontario, we would be looking to Wyerton Willie to see what his shadow was to predict what's going to happen in the, uh, the rest of the winter, but he died in 2017. So because of the time change also, they come out at 8 o'clock in the morning, I've actually gone to Shabanaki Sam, which is in Nova Scotia, which is an hour earlier than us, and I hate to announce the fact that he actually saw his shadow this morning, so we're supposed to have at least six more weeks of, uh, of winter. I was just telling John Connolly that uh, this is the first day that we will be at zero degrees C since the first of December. Uh, we have about two meters of snow outside in my backyard and, uh, and uh, we've been for the last 22 days in double digits below uh, uh, minus temperatures. So we hit minus 32 the other night. So it's a little chilly and we're looking forward to summer here. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is I may get interrupted occasionally. My research assistant here is right now fast asleep and snoring behind me, but uh, I'm the only one in the house. So if you hear any barking, it's because he's defending uh, the house from the post office or a snow truck that goes by or a garbage truck that goes by. So usually he's pretty good, but he may wake up and bark. So, okay. So just kind of background. I was going to give a little background on peatlands. I am sure that everybody in Ireland knows what a peatland is and what peat is all about, but uh, just in case, I thought I'd cover it a little bit. <coughs> I've got some examples of Canadian and Irish peatlands kind of extent. Then we'll look at the peatlands climate and land use change through the idea of irrecoverable carbon, which is an issue that's become pretty prominent now. And that includes greenhouse gases, what happens with climate change and what happens with land use change in greenhouse gases. And then if I've got time at the end, I may comment a bit on the, um, the peatlands, the science policy interface with Canada and the uh, EU. So what's driving all this research has driven my research for, for many, many years and <clears throat> a lot of people in the geosciences. You just need to look at this iconic glass, graph from Mauna Loa. It's the CO2 uh, graph, concentrations in the atmosphere. It's got two things on it. One is a solid black line, which is the seasonal corrected trend. It's a secular trend going up. The concentrations you see now are over 400 on average through the, uh, through the year. Uh, that used to be 280 before the Industrial Revolution. 
uh, this is causing a lot of problems related to climate change. The second thing that's on this graph that most people don't pay much attention to is the monthly mean, and that's the red line going up and down on this graph. And this red line indicates the role of the northern biosphere in the CO2 in the atmosphere. And it wasn't until uh, uh, Keeling and uh, Ravel did these experiments, when they first did them, they thought they had an error with their instrument because they saw the zigzag back and forth. But we now know that it's actually the about a six ppm excursion that happens every year because of the biosphere. And that actually was one of the really first times that really show the importance of the biosphere. The other graph that comes from the uh, Global uh, Carbon Project to look at is the e sources of carbon to the atmosphere. So we look over here, this is 1850 to 2000. These are the annual emissions. The gray is the fossil fuels, but the yellow is CO2 that goes into the atmosphere due to land use change. And then this is where the carbon CO2 is ending up. And the dark blue uh, here is the ocean sink. The green is the terrestrial sink. And then the blue, the light blue is the atmospheric sink. And that's what you see the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. So what you see up until the Second World War is that land use change actually dominated over fossil fuel emissions as a source of CO2 to the atmosphere. It still represents in a proportion of the CO2 that we put in the atmosphere annually, about 10%. So the biosphere is a significant player to think about it. And it's also become really important if people have been talking a lot about it because of what we are referring natural uh, climate-based solutions. So what's peat? Peat simply is partially decomposed plants. It's plants that don't decompose because of certain restrictions. The plants that we have here in North America, but you've got very similar plants in some of your bogs, dominated by sphagnum moss, some of the sundews, these are pitcher plants here. This is a, a cotton grass that you see here. When those plants die, they produce litter. And over time, that becomes peat. I actually didn't do that. This slide was prepared from another talk a long time ago, but this actually is a peat profile in Ireland uh, from Tullamore. I'm sure you could all recognize that it's from Tullamore uh, there. So it's a, this uh, distance here. So this really is a mass of partially decomposed plants and peat is no more than, than, than that. Uh, what are peatlands? Well, peatlands simply are massive landscapes that uh, have accumulated partially decomposed organic material. Countries get quite excited over how they define peatlands, the organic content on the most of the peatlands I work on, it's 100% organic content or 90% organic content. And that's the same I know in Ireland. This is from the Hudson's Bay Lowlands. This is what a typical peat profile looks like near the surface where we have really fibric peat, uh, partially decomposed plant material. And then somewhere down about 30, 20 centimeters down, we move into the anoxic zone where the water is permanently saturated there, and then the decomposition processes are aerobic. So why are peatlands created? Peatlands are created simply because the production of that plant material over time exceeds the decomposition of litter and the dead organic matter. So if you've got a constant imbalance of inputs over the outputs that happen, then you will have to accumulate uh, organic matter on the surface, and peatlands have been doing that here in North America since the end of the last glaciation. So over 10,000, 12,000 years, or in this area here, it's about 8,000 years. Uh, as you go further north, it's 5,000 years, have been accumulating uh, organic deposits. And it's the same in Ireland, and they can get upwards to some places, can get over 10 meters, 10 meters deep. But it's not really that simple. What it is is that peatland production is really not that high. If, you, if we looked at net primary product, like productivity of peatlands compared to other ecosystems, it's actually very, very low. It's that the decomposition in peatlands is very small when it's compared to other ecosystems. And that's because the plant material is not easily decomposed. Sphagnum is not a great plant for a microbe that breaks down or depolymerizes solid or, or uh, yeah, soil organic matter. The presence of water inhibits the decomposition because it reduces the diffusion of oxygen into the soil, so it's primarily organic or primarily uh, anoxic. Uh, 
And then the byproducts of uh, organic compounds from the decomposition itself further reduce the uh, decomposition. And in fact, when we look down through two meters, or three meters down into the peatlands, they're quite dystrophic, the peatland ecosystems, because they, have, of, they build up inhibitors for decomposition. So if you change peatlands, either by drying them out or by altering them through land use, and you change this balance, the real central question is whether they become sources of greenhouse gases back to the atmosphere. Uh, peatlands are located throughout mainly the northern hemisphere, 55 degrees further north. And there's also a set of peatlands that are pretty prominent in the tropical uh, forest areas. These peatlands are under siege right at the moment um, because of drainage that are going on. If we look at the world soil organic matter, what we do is that we see these very large deposits that have more than 500 tons per hectare in the northern peatland, uh, peatland regions. Uh, probably was a Brit that did this map because if you look at it, Scotland's got a lot of carbon in it, but Ireland just seems to have a little bit down here out right on the bottom uh, peninsula. So I think that map probably needs to be revised for uh, to get the Irish peat uh, in there. So the real difference, and I've started doing this in talks because of uh, people's lack of familiarity with peatlands. So if we look at the tropical forest over here on the left, tropical forest has a huge amount of carbon in living biomass in the trees, but it has actually quite a small amount of, of uh, carbon stored in the soils. Uh, tropical forests are quite impoverished for carbon in the soils, and it's because it turns over and there's tons of microbial activity and they're warm and they can be wet a good portion of the year. So they have a lot of conditions that uh, really enhance decomposition. The net primary productivity of tropical forests is some of the highest productivity in the world. So very high tro uh, productivity ecosystems and 90% or 80% of the carbon is in living biomass. We then go north to the boreal forest and we see that the carbon is about 50% partition between living biomass and more is stored in the soils. Why is more stored in the soils? Because now you're in an area that has a portion of the year that's in winter, which reduces decomposition. And you're also not, the vegetation is not of high quality for decomposition to, to occur. The biomass is about half that of what you see in, in uh, tropical forests. Then we go to peatlands, and peatlands are very, very different. They're so small in terms of the living biomass that's on here that I can't even represent it with a line on here. It's, it's, it's tiny compared to what happens with the, uh, uh, the boreal forest. But what we have here is we have uh, 10 times to 50 times more carbon stored per square meter than you do in, the, and this is the peat. This is the very, the very large high density uh, carbon stores that happen here. The NPP is tiny. So a lot of people are going on about peatlands being great for natural climate solutions because they're persistent carbon sinks, which they are. But relative to other uh, ecosystems on an annual basis, they're a pretty small uh, sink. The really big issue with peatlands is the carbon that it's stored in the peatlands and what the fate of that would be. So if we look at Canada, there's a huge, a huge uh, set of uh, uh, across the boreal regions. The greens are where the predominant peatlands are. Approximately 12% of Canada's area is covered with peatlands. There's 1.6 million square kilometers of peatlands in Canada. If you look at the soil carbon map of Canada, what you see is almost the exact same image that the really high density, which is in the reds, are the organic soils that have tons of peatlands uh, uh, carbon in it. Um, if we look globally at the uh, forest biomes, we see most is stored in uh, the boreal forest here, about twice as much. And in Canadian peatlands, it's about 150 petagrams. Now, I know you all think about petagrams when you sleep at night. We, we emit about 10 petagrams a year as fossil fuel emissions to the atmosphere. The atmosphere has about 750 petagrams of carbon in it, just to give you a frame of reference. We're doing lots of things in Canada. 
uh, to kind of destroy peatlands. The, the, you'll see the numbers slightly different here uh, in terms of the uh, square kilometers of peatlands. And unlike Ireland, where you've got people like John and that that are doing very good analysis of peatlands, most of the Canadian peatlands are totally inaccessible. It's done by remote sensing. A lot of them are forested, so we really can't tell the difference between the forests and the, uh, and the peatlands themselves. So this number you literally have to take with a grain of salt. Uh, however, even given that uncertainty, there is one heck of a lot of peatlands in Canada. These are what we're doing in disturbances, agriculture, mining, forestry, flooding. And then down here is one of the areas I work on is the horticultural extraction of peat. And it's actually a tiny loss of uh, peatlands. So you see it's 350 square kilometers. The wetland and, uh, loss in Canada is estimated historically to be about 200,000 square kilometers. I think Ireland is about 70,000 square kilometers, if I'm right. I'm not sure on that number. So we've lost a couple of Irelands or three, three Irelands in terms of wetlands that we've drained. Uh, the peatland loss has been suggested to be about uh, 12,000 square kilometers. So that's a really iffy number, too. We really don't know. The current rate of peatland loss, which we have a fairly good idea, is about 120 kilometers square kilometers per year mainly by mining seismic well pads of uh, roads and extraction is a tiny uh, amount that we actually lose peatlands. Most of these are inadvertent. Uh, we just have to destroy the peatlands to get to the minerals we're after. If we compare that with Ireland, uh, you've got 1.46 million hectares of uh, peatlands. I think that's about 20% of the area of Ireland, but I'm, don't take that as gospel truth. The uh, this is from uh, Renault Wilson's uh, work uh, summary that John put me on to just recently. Uh, what are you doing to peatlands? Well, you have a small fraction that are still in, uh, in natural state. Many that you've converted for forestry and are using for forestry, they've been converted into agricultural systems where they're grasslands and croplands. And many have been extracted for industrial purposes, uh, that is uh, for fuels. Uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. We do not do that in Canada. The only extraction we do in Canada is for, uh, is for horticultural purposes and, and also for using the peat and sewage treatment. Uh, the types of peat lands that you have in Ireland are dominated by in the interior by raised bogs. Uh, the, uh, this is a low Atlantic bog, this is a mountain bog, and this is a raised bog near the interior, and these, this is a cutover system which you have a fair bit of in Ireland. So if we start thinking about the context of how to look at peatlands in this context, we have an eco natural ecosystem over here that has biomass and soil carbon stored. It doesn't really matter what the units are here. You can use tons per hectare. I usually use grams per square meter because I do a lot of flux work and that's what we use. The biomass carbon, as soon as you get rid of the living biomass, that's gone. It could be, it could re easily regrow if you did restoration out here, it's recoverable. The carbon that you remove from the soils uh, could be a loss of carbon that would happen, but could be recoverable over a number of years. Uh, and what you lose that cannot be recovered, we call irrecoverable carbon. So as far as the atmosphere is concerned, it's this irrecoverable carbon that is really, really important uh, to do that. So if you did vegetate, you took a forest, you replaced it with agricultural crops, the biomass of agricultural crops would be a lot less than the original forest. So then there would be a lot of carbon that's lost. Uh, if you till that soil an awful lot and you let this carbon mineralize, you lose a lot of carbon back to the atmosphere. You might record some of it. And then there's a stable amount of soil carbon that would be stored that is basically always there. So I'm going to use this framework to think about things. And it's really interesting. This is people when I started thinking about things in this sort of way. But I think when we start thinking about land use, it's really important to think about. The other comment I'll make is we're focused on a 100 year time period. And that's absolutely ridiculous when we talk about, about ecosystems, particularly ecosystems are a very long period of time. Uh, the reason why we're focused on 100 years, I think, is that's because the gen, you know people live somewhere around about that time period. But it's also a, a vestige left over from the early climate modeling is that we can only run the climate models for about 100 years. Uh, now, that's not a restriction at all with the computing we have. Uh, 
So we've got this 100 year time frame in our brain about thinking about doing carbon and looking at things. And I think it much, makes much more sense when we're talking about ecosystem carbon to think about this recoverable and irrecoverable carbon uh, and think about it in the global perspective of what it does. So to take this in the context, if we think about the risk to climate and the carbon pools, from climate change, we have carbon that uh, is at risk. And what you would do in terms of, of, of the risk, it's uh, if there's no uh, risk by climate change, the system is resilient. Then the question would be, you might monitor the situation. If it's less resilient, you might need to manage the ecosystems to manage that carbon. And then if you have uh, uh, carbon that's not really at risk, if you, there's nothing you can do about it, then you do direct management. But then of these, if you're not affected by climate change or you're affected by climate change, the question you need to look at is the risk of loss due to human disturbance. And when we're talking about ecosystem carbon, it's actually human disturbance is probably the bigger loss of carbon than climate change. This may come in the future, but I'll show and admit that the peatlands are quite resistant. So it's really the disturbance, human disturbance that we're interested in. And this is the long-term carbon in the near term to be able to assess that recoverable, irrecoverable carbon. Okay, peatlands are really interesting because they produce two greenhouse gases. They produce, they take up CO2. The, if you summarize, done a number of review papers on this, they take up about 20 to 30 grams a year. They're small sources of methane to the atmosphere of three to 20 grams. And they're no really apparent source to N2O to the atmosphere unless we've used them for agricultural systems. <clears throat> At Mare Bleu here, just uh, about a, it's about 120 kilometers from my house, just east of Ottawa. Uh, it's a peatland that's about 8,000 years old. We've been monitoring the CO2 exchange on that peatland since 1998. It's the longest continuous running carbon site. You can see our boardwalks that come out here. Take a look at these beaver ponds. I'll come back to them. We have ignored them until recently, and they actually turned out to be part of the story. We've measured this by eddy covariance chambers, uh, doing concentrations uh, year in, year out. And this is a bar graph that shows basically the 16-year net ecosystem carbon balance. What you see on here are the dissolved organic carbon that we lose, the methane that we lose, the net ecosystem exchange it takes up. But the number you're really interested in the gold bars, which is the net ecosystem exchange with the atmosphere. That's what the peatlands are taking up, this peatland is taking up. And if we do an average of this over now up to 2014, but the number is the same if we do the last five years too, the sink to Meribla is about 56 grams per square meter per year, which is larger than that 20 grams that we have from some other peatlands that we worked on. But when I did the first work on here, we did it between 1998 to 2004. We did our first publication and we had it about at 30 grams, but we've been getting 70 grams uh, for the last uh, decade or more. And we wanted to figure out what was going on with that. Uh, because uh, we're interested in the long-term average on this thing. And lo and behold, we find out that our national rodent, the beaver, has an impact on the, uh, the peatland. We never really would have thought of this. But we always wondered because the beaver ponds go up and down. And the first period of time in that period from 1998 to 2000, the uh, conservation authority that uh, manages the land, the National Capital Christmas, were, damming the, were taking the beavers out. So this is the beaver pond. You can see the beaver ponds, that's our tower here. The water flows this direction here. What happens is when the beavers manage, or manage, they don't do it consciously, but they wanna keep the water level up in the beaver ponds here. Uh, if the beaver pond water level is low, which was here relative to the water table in the peatland here, then there's a, very, there's a steep hydraulic grading in this direction here, and there's more lateral water flow. During years where the beaver ponds are higher, the hydraulic gradient from the center of the, pond, the uh, peatland to the beaver ponds is much smaller and that you lose less water. And the impact of that is, is that the water tables on average are higher in the peatland during the years that the beavers are really active and keep the water level up. So this is a bar graph here where you're looking at, and the only thing that you really need to look at is this lower graph here, which is B, which is the annual net ecosystem exchange for the atmosphere. That's what it's taking up. 
We did this by simulation and we also can do it with the measurements we've done. <clears throat> when the uh, beaver ponds are low, meaning there's high disturbance, the net ecosystem exchange is about 50 grams per meter square per year uptake. When it's medium activity in the sense that the beavers dams are breaking and then they're building them back up again, what we find is the uptake is slightly over 100. And then we get about 120 grams when it's a very stable environment and there's no disturbance going on. So this is really interesting. And we've just we've submitted a paper. And the reason why I raise this is this is relevant to some of the things that you're doing in Ireland, where you're looking at restoration, is that the hydrological stressors, this is what a groundwater person would call this, what you're trying to equilibrate to in terms of the flows on your peatland have a big impact on the water tables in the peatland. And Shane Reagan's done a lot on peatlands. Uh, where he's actually looked at areas that have been drained all around the peatlands. And so now you've got uh, maroon kind of groundwater mounds, which will have a profound impact on it. The peatlands have accumulated carbon for uh, 10 to 20 millennia. And we did a bunch of work a while ago where we asked the question of what impact does that have on the global system? And there are sources of methane to the atmosphere, but the methane actually has a chemistry in the atmosphere, so it equilibrates with the atmosphere quite quickly, but that would warm the atmosphere. The removal of CO2, which is the blue line here, is actually taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, which has a cooling effect. And very soon after the peatlands, about 500 years to 1,000 years, the CO2 uptake dominates over the methane, and globally, what we find is that peatlands have had an impact that they have removed about, they've removed about 70 petagrams or 74.2 in this simulation we did of carbon of CO2 from the atmosphere. And the net effect of that is that it's actually reduced the greenhouse gas warming that would exist in the, the natural greenhouse gas warming on the order of about half a watt per meter squared per year or, or per uh, um, all over the globe. Uh, and to put that in perspective, the anthropogenic warming we've done over the last two year, uh, last 200 years is about uh, 1.5 watts. So this, bat, this is really the climate contribution that peatlands do. And that's what we want to maintain. If we start buggering up the peatlands, we move this up in this direction here, which means that they now contribute to the problem. So how sensitive are peatlands to climate change? The only really way to do that, because these things exist for a thousand years, is to build some simulation models to do that. We've had a lot of experience on doing this. The last one we've done is the McGill wetland model that we're, we just uh, published or published a number of years ago. Zhang Hua Wu, who is uh, uh, now a professor of biogeochemistry at Memorial University in Newfoundland, did a bunch of simulations back in 2014. These are simulations for bog. These are simulations for fen. The different colors on here are the different climate scenarios that we were looking at. But for the bogs, you see that there's a slight decrease in the uptake of CO2, but there's still large sinks for CO2. So climate change really doesn't seem to have a big of impact on the sink for CO2. Uh, these are for peatlands that are, are undisturbed. However, if we look at fans, what we saw is that in the two more severe climate scenarios, and they were severe when we did them in 2014, these are actually the course that we're on now. They're, they're not severe in terms of reality. We actually found that the fans flipped to being a source of CO2 and a substantive source of CO2 to the atmosphere. So the fans are much more sensitive to, are much more sensitive to uh, climate change than bogs. In Canada, about 70% of the peatlands are bogs and about 30% of the peatlands are fens in Ireland or in, in Canada. I do not know what the ratio is of fens and bogs to uh, uh, in peatlands in Ireland, but I suspect that there's not that many fens in Ireland. Anyways, this is interesting because this got us thinking, the community got us thinking too about the stability of peatlands. And so bog, ombotrophic bogs seem to be quite stable and resistant systems, whereas fens seem to be seem to be uh, quite instable, or not instable, but have, lack the resistance, uh, resilience. So if we look in the Hudson's Bay lowlands, this is a very large fan. Uh, 
and this is a large bog that we worked on, we would expect these systems to be quite resilient and stable to continue on. We would expect these systems to be less stable because they rely on outside water to actually maintain their moisture conditions. We haven't advanced much on this kind of thinking because on a landscape like this, it's really difficult to simulate the, uh, the uh, hydrology. Uh, we would love to work on nice basin uh, bogs like you have in Ireland, but this is 240,000 square kilometers of this is continuous in the Hudson's Bay Lowlands. Okay, the uses of Canadian peat, <clears throat> almost all of it we're extracting for land use change that happens, goes into being used for, uh, goes now to use for horticultural purposes. That's the only real act of removal that we had. Historically, we did bog cutting like you do in Ireland. <clears throat> the settlers actually built sod houses uh, quite extensively. Some European immigrants, particularly from Holland, drain peatlands and use them for agricultural purposes. And we do, do have some cranberry. But the actual extraction of peat is the main use of peat in Canada. If we look at the Canadian peatland statistics, uh, we look at about 65% of our peatlands that we're using, 300 square kilometers or so, are currently under extraction. 17% have been restored, and Canadian Canada requires the peatlands to be restored when they're opened up. 15%, there's been no intervention at all. Uh, and these are historical peatlands that we're now going back to restore. And 3% is that they've been converted to other land use, for example, agriculture or forests. Now, to finish off the talk, I want to go through a series of scenarios. And this is work that I'm doing recently. We haven't published this work, but we're thinking a lot about it. And what's driven us to think about this is that uh, Ireland is the same as in Canada. Everybody's going gaga over net zero um, emissions. Um, I am not convinced it's the answer because net zero emissions is simply balancing the emissions with uptake as opposed and takes our, our vision off reducing emissions in the first place. I think what we need to do is we need to be very aggressive on reducing emissions and then think about what we can't do, uh, we may do by um, do by um, just pull up. It's okay. Lie down. Lie down, boy. The post person just came. So, uh, so what we do is, if you think about this on the left hand side, we have a peatland that's intact. It has a little bit of vegetation on the surface moss. What we do is, when we go to extract them, we take that vegetation off. We remove the living biomass, so there's no longer any net primary productivity. All we have is the residual uh, peat, which is dead plant material. And then what we do is a portion of that, we extract it, we mine it out, and then we may leave uh, intact peat behind, depending on what you want to do it. So the typical thing, I think, in Ireland, when you were doing things for fuel, is that you extracted the peat hands right down to the, you know, uh, the mineral uh, soils. And then uh, in Canada, we always leave a residual about a meter and a half of peat because of the, we found we need that for restoration. That extracted peat could be used for fuel. I put the fuel example in here because of uh, you, that's what you used to do in Ireland. You don't do it anymore. In Canada, what we do is we use it, the primary, actually, I do not have the primary use of peat up here because it's modified quite substantially. Peat is actually used now, the largest consumer of peat in Canada is the cannabis industry that grows pot uh, in Canada. <clears throat> That's where all my students want to work is in the uh, greenhouses or growing pot. But uh, this is a mushroom uh, growing mushrooms here. These are uh, uh, petunias that are growing, but bedding crops, uh, bedding flower. A large amount of it used in agriculture uh, in greenhouses in Canada. We have quite a greenhouse uh, economy here because we're a cold country. When that peat's used, often it's dumped out back, it's spent peat, and it's actually just left there and becomes vegetated, and it would slowly continue to decompose. But a large portion of that peat is actually buried into soils, uh, and that would actually stabilize the organic matter. 
and it's used in nurseries. They put an awful lot in nurseries and tree nurseries and things like this. And part of the best practice that we're trying to get the industry to do is to think about burying the peat that they've removed. Because when they remove this peat, you want to minimize its decomposition because that's restoring, that's putting the carbon into the atmosphere. When you think about it, a typical peatland would remove the ones that we're working on, they remove somewhere between 100 and 300 kilograms of carbon per square meter over a 40 to 60 year uh, lifespan. So they're removing a third to half to two thirds of the peat. For when they do it for uh, uh, agricultural purposes here in Canada, what we do is that we're working on restoring the peat. They're, some of them are abandoned and they do have spontaneous uh, revegetation in some of them, but most of them look like this. And I have to admit on my travels with uh, people like John and Shaney in Ireland, I have seen some pretty mucked up peatlands in Ireland too that, that are slowly just decomposing and putting CO2 in the atmosphere. But in Canada, we have an active restoration program. We use a thing on particularly in the bogs, it's called the moss transfer technique, which has been prone proven to be about 70 to 80% effective in restoration. You go on these peatlands, if you put somebody like me, who's not a specialist in vegetation, but has been on veget and been in peatlands a lot, uh, it actually looks like it's about, uh, it looks identical to, uh, to um, a natural peatland. In Ireland, you've been, when you mine the peat right down to the bottom, you use wet restoration techniques. And then the idea is that this would come back to a peatland sometime in the future. What I want to do is I want to look at this, what happens here when we do peat on the restoration side of things and what happens when we do peat uh, uh, without restoring. So we've done a whole bunch of measurements on peatlands for restored peatlands. These are peatlands that are being extracted. These are peatlands that have been restored. So what you see here is the restoration, the initial restoration, which is here over this uh, period of four years has resulted in a decrease of 100 grams being emitted to the atmosphere. So restoration in the early part of the vegetation establishing on the surface of peatland reduces the emission substantially. If we continue that restoration, we continue that restoration over here. So the restoration, this is where we've got paired peatlands that we're looking at that are over a decade old, what we do is we convert them from a source by restoring them to a sink that is quite close to what we're seeing at Mer Bleu. So we results in 300 grams net difference between that restoration. The, so there's substantive carbon uptake, uh, far more than I ever would expect it. In fact, I have to eat my words now because I argued you could never restore peatlands effectively enough. If we look at methane, there is a methane contribution that comes from natural peatlands. These are the restored peatlands. These are the unrestored peatlands. So the methane emissions are really, really high uh, here. And then this is a dried, abandoned peatland where the methane emissions are quite low. So all in all, if you restore peatlands, if you restore peatlands, you move them from large carbon sources to the atmosphere to these two dots here. These two dots here are restored peatland seven years and 14 years after the restoration, they become carbon sinks again. So the faster you restore a peatland, the better it is as far as the atmosphere is concerned. So the first message here is restore your peatlands and restore them quickly. The second thing is though, we're removing hundreds of kilograms of carbon. What happens to that carbon once it leaves the peatland? That is determines the overall impact on the atmosphere. So what we can do is we can do this by modeling, very simple. We have peat mass here. We have the net primary productivity coming in, the decomposition. What I did is this is a very simple model that we've done. And there, we've built a lot of models like this. Uh, those of you that are familiar with Dickie Flymo's work in 1984, these models are very similar to that. We just simply had net primary productivity and decomposition. This is the height of the peatland over here in meters. And this is uh, for a peatland in Eastern Canada, which would be about six meters deep and would accumulate about six kilograms uh, or 600 kilograms of carbon uh, per square meter through the entire, that six meter profile. 
If you look at it from the atmospheric perspective, this is the accumulation of carbon in the peatland, and this is the accumulation of CO2. So these two lines are identical to each other. This is simply 3.6 times that because it's, it, the units are in CO2 per square meter as opposed to carbon per square meter. So that is the climate benefit that peatlands are doing over time is accumulating carbon. Now what we do is we add to this, and the first case that I'm going to look at is the case of using it for fuel, is what you do is you remove the, you burn the fuel, which means that you basically, depending on the burn efficiency, return 100% of the carbon to the atmosphere, and then you may restore afterwards. So if you extract the peatland right down to the mineral soils, this is the loss of mass that happens in, of carbon in the atmosphere, so it goes to zero. And then if you restored that and you were, I would assume 100% efficiency in, is that you recover that carbon in about 8,000 years, you get that carbon stored again. This is one of the things that you're struggling with in iron right now is can you, can you restore these peatlands to, to get them back to being functioning peatlands? This is the CO2 and the carbon emitted to the atmosphere. So this is the uptake of CO2 then this large pulse that goes out of the atmosphere. And then if you successfully restore them, this would be the carbon accumulation. So now we look at the condition here where we're looking at horticultural peat, and then we're dumping it out back and it's being emitted to the atmosphere. In this case here, we only mine the peat lands down to about 1.5 meters because we leave a base there for restoration. We, we know that we've been successful in the restoration and we know that it behaves about the same here. So what we have is a large uh, uptake of CO2, then a loss of CO2 to the atmosphere. And then in about 5,000 years after restoration, we would return that CO2 to it. And then it continues to operate as a peatland out here. This is with a loss of about 150 grams in this, uh, this simulation. This is based on 40 years of extraction uh, and 1.5 meters remaining. The last one I want to look at is the restoration of the peatlands. We do the restoration. We use it for horticultural purposes. But then we take that spent peat and we put it and bury it in mineral soils. In this case, I haven't done any consideration of permanent uh, burial. What I've simply done is said that, well, it will take a hundred years to 500 years to a thousand years to turn this carbon over and return it to the atmosphere. When we do that, this is the original one that I showed you, the original case here. And these now are the two cases of 500 years and a thousand year turnover time. What it does is it reduces the amount of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere and it reduces the amount of time that it takes to accumulate that CO2 back. It doesn't eliminate it. If, we, if, uh, if I add in permanent uh, stabilization of organic matter, which is quite possible, uh, but we need to think this through more, these bumps are a little bit less, but this actually substantially reduces the amount of CO2 going into the atmosphere. So the key thing is if you're going to use P, best practices would be to try to reduce try to re, uh, reduce the time from re restoration and then get the peat into some form of uh, burial that stabilizes the peat. Okay, so what have we learned? We've learned that pristine peatlands are small but persistent sinks of CO2. They're small sources of atmospheric methane, but it has a chemistry, so it equilibrates quite quickly. Peat represents a very large store of atmospheric carbon, so it produces long-term cooling on a global over the Holocene. Climate change may result in changes of, of sinks, but possibly temporary sources. But peatlands have a lot of self-regulation, self-regulating feedbacks in them. So I'm not really that concerned about climate change. Fire is, I haven't considered fire at all, and that, that is a significant issue. Land use change, I'm far more concerned about land use change. Can it can result in large local losses of carbon uh, when you do it? And that what uh, most of the carbon, or at least some of that carbon is irrecoverable. So the conclusion with this is to leave it in the ground. That is what to do with the peat. Arguing that peatlands need to be preserved because they're a natural based solution for contemporary climate. I'm not really sure about that because the net primary productivity is very low on this. 
This is what the EU and a lot of countries are basing their stuff on. A lot of the arguments about restoring your peatland is based on this being a natural uh, solution. But the real solution is to leave it in the ground as best we can and preserve the carbon stocks that you've got there. So I would argue in Ireland, your biggest bang for your buck for restoration is not what you're going to start accumulating in those peatlands now, but what you're going to prevent from mineralizing to go into the atmosphere. That, that would be the kind of policy that uh, I would argue. Okay, so that's a quick summary of what I think is happening in the carbon world, climate and land use change, and I'm more than happy to, to, to take questions. Great, yeah, well, that was uh, very comprehensive. <laughs> um, so um, if anyone has any questions, um, please put them in the chat. Um, if, if there's a lot, then I'll group them. Um, otherwise, um, I'll, I'll suggest that you ask uh, Roger directly. Um, so uh, Padraig Carmody asks that, um, he says he recently read that the earth is regreening as CO2 promotes plant regrowth. Do you have any thoughts on how significant that might be as a sink? So the earth is regreening. That's the question? As a result of um, the CO2 promoting plant growth. Yeah, okay. So um, there's no question that portions of the earth are regreening. Uh, we see that with the satellite images. Um, the first driver of that is that areas that we we removed forests originally for agricultural purposes. So if you look at Eastern North America, large portions of Eastern North America have greened because uh, two centuries ago, the European settlers basically cut down all the forests in Eastern North America. And then they moved West when the prairies opened up and it was uh, uh, Oklahoma and those places where agriculture moved. So there's a natural greening that's happening as a re result of uh, reforestation that's happened. The second largest greening that's happening is in the Arctic that's happening. And as, as the permafrost melts, the root plants roots are able to go deeper. And we're shifting from just ground surface plants into now shrubs moving into the north and small trees are moving north. The CO2 fertilization question is actually one that a lot of people think about, but it's actually a very small portion of what we think is happening. Uh, a lot of the global models have worked on this problem. Uh, and we now know that the greening, it's CO2 is not the limiting nutrient for plant growth. Uh, nitrogen is primarily the nutri uh, limiting nutrient. So we do see elevated uptake of CO2 in those areas that aren't nitrogen impoverished. So it's one reason why the air pollution for nitrogen, nitrogen deposition may be a good thing in a perverse sort of way. But most of the areas are not really receiving a lot of uh, um, increased productivity due to CO2. In peatland, certainly, there's uh, very little evidence that uh, elevated CO2 um, results in any increase in productivity. And that's peatlands are nutrient impoverished. And most forested ecosystems in the world are pretty nutrient impoverished. Phosphorus is a limiting nutrient when you go into the tropical regions. Nitrogen seems to be the primary nutrient, the limiting nutrient once you get above 30 degrees north. So I'm not um, a big fan of the, uh, or I'm, I, I have yet to see substantive evidence of globally significant elevation, increased elevation of uh, a CO2 fertilization effect. Okay, um, I have two questions here that I'll put, and uh, then uh, we have two questions from John, and I'll, I'll invite him to ask them himself. But uh, Louis asks, um, uh, says thank you for the great presentation. Do you have any idea of the underlying processes that uh, make fans more sensitive than bogs to climate change? Uh, and then secondly, um, Canada is warming uh, more so than global average. What effect is this having on peatlands? You refer to the effects of fire, but what about drying effects of sustained higher average temperatures as peatlands presumably oxidize when they dry out? Yeah, so both those good questions. The first one is the fen, fen versus bogs. Why are they more sensitive? Uh, a bogs are what we call ombotrophic systems, so they receive all their uh, they receive all their water from precipitation. 
Uh, so the water balance of a peatland is the balance between what comes in as precipitation, what evaporates as evapotranspiration, and what leaves as uh, discharge out of the system. Uh, all those, the evaporation and the, the evaporation and the discharge are regulated by the, the long-term average of the water table position. And so when you decrease precipitation, that alters the storage, which in turn produces a feedback to reduce evaporation and reduce runoff. But also the growth of the peatland itself is a function of the amount of excess water you've had. So when you dry peatlands out, they start grow, they stop growing um, as well as they do. And that has the effect of bringing the surface back down towards the more moist conditions and the deeper peat. That's the self-regulation that I'm talking about. And so that exists in ombotrophic systems, bogs, but it doesn't exist in fens to any great extent because there's another additional water that comes to the fans, which is either run on from the adjacent landscape or groundwater input. And so for us to be able to understand the hydrology of fans, we have to understand them in their catchment characteristics. Uh, and that is a much more difficult problem to pose and you need to then think about them in the hydrological catchment. Um, so, and there's been a lot less research done on the hydrology of fans than there have been on bogs because they don't, they don't have confined outflows, uh, so they're a difficult uh, system to work on. So uh, I've been telling my graduate students that uh, that's a good nut to crack um, uh, when they finish. So that's the bog fen difference. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other question was about the drying in the north that's happening in Canada, and certainly the question of fire, and there is increase in fire that's happening in western Canada. It's not in Eastern Canada. In fact, in Eastern Canada, the North is getting wetter. It is getting much, much warmer, but it's getting wetter. In Western Canada, it's already pretty dry and uh, it's getting a little bit drier and that's helping promote the fires that happen on the peatlands. But we don't see the runaway mineralization that we thought we would see of uh, the peat. And the reason for that is, is that even the peatlands dry out, they have a huge water retention that happens in them. So it does, it does increase the amount of oxygen that can get into the peatlands, but not substantially. And there's a whole bunch of enzymic uh, regulations that happen. So we haven't seen this mass wasting that happens in the, in the natural peatlands due to uh, a drying out. On the, on the uh, peatlands that have been uh, altered because of land use change, then the regulating processes are, are kind of out the window. But these peatlands don't waste away. And I, you know that actually, all you gotta do is drive around the countryside in Ireland and see all the peatlands that have been cut. And they still have substantial amount of peats that has not been lost to the atmosphere. So maybe over thousands of years that would happen, but this is not I know people used to write about the carbon bomb and they thought that it was going to happen, but I think these things are pretty slow in their response to the uh, to the system. And our model suggests that climate change isn't rapid enough to destabilize the peatlands, but that's that's in modeling land uh, that we do that. Um, John uh, has two questions. Um, I'll, I, you can ask them um, here yourself. Otherwise, uh, I'll I'll put them to Nigel. Go ahead, Tommy. All right. Um, so um, he notes um, as a very interesting study on the after use of horticultural peace. Uh, do these results go on to inform policy in Canada? And then secondly, what do you have any opinions on restoring upland peatlands, that is peatlands on steeper slopes? Yeah, OK, so the, I'll deal with the second question first. I don't I don't even think about them. Uh, a Canadian now, I, I mean, you have you have a lot of blanket bogs that are upland peatlands. We actually have a ton of them here in Canada too. They're probably a lot more than you have in Ireland, but they are a tiny fraction of the peatlands that we have in Canada. So people like me don't even think about them. What we think about is the very large continental peatlands that are in the Hudson's Bay lowlands, like Mare Bleu. Uh, that would be probably 90% of the peatlands in Canada, 95% of the peatlands in Canada that we think about. So we don't get blanket bogs. And in fact, I never even thought about blanket bogs being on slopes until John dragged me down to uh, down to uh, Cary to look at peatlands. It's the first time I saw peatland on a slope and I couldn't understand 
what was going on because I would have thought no self-respecting peatland would ever grow on a slope, but it does. And then I actually, I saw slope uh, peatland avalanches that happened where they had gone down the slope. So very bizarre for a Canadian to see these type of things. If I went to Newfoundland, I would see them. I would see them on the Avedon Palenza. I would see them in BC uh, in the mountain regions, but it's not something that has received an awful lot of attention here in, in Canada. Uh, largely because the Irish and the Brits have done an excellent job at looking at uh, blanket bogs. Uh, and it's also given a bit of a misrepresentation, I think, for what might happen to peatlands in climate change and land use change, because a lot of the literature is dominated by these uh, blanket bog hydrology, which is really not what happens, for example, in Sweden, Finland, uh, Russia, in, in Canada. So that's an easy one to deal with. I, I don't, I don't deal with them. I think, it, I think it's a big issue, uh, but it's not one that um, um, I've uh, worked on. So you, your first question, John, I'm trying to remember what it was. Uh, it was about um, uh, horticultural piece uh, and yeah. whether these results in foreign policy. Yeah, I think this is a key issue. I mean, one of the things that we're doing, and so uh, we are working with the Canadian peat industry. The Canadian peat industry is actually very progressive in the sense that they've been restoring peatlands long before the government requirements were for that. Uh, so then they asked us about 10 years ago, can you guys come and do uh, your CO2 measurements to see what our restoration does to peatlands? Knowing full well that I had predicted when they provided us uh, partial funding for doing this, that there was no way in hell that these peatlands were restored to being functionally carbon systems. So uh, they knew that I thought they were going to produce negative results for them. And lo and behold, they actually turn into pretty good carbon sinks. So again, I was eating my words um, on this. And so after, after about a decade of really good restoration and ecologically driven restoration, then they returned to being carbon sinks. But then I asked them the question, I said, well, yeah, but you're removing two thirds of the carbon. So what's the fate of that? And they said, what do you mean, what's the fate of that? I said, you use it in growing, right? They go into grow in Canada, you go into growing media. It's easy if you're doing it for uh, using it as a fossil fuel because you, you, you basically burn that and that goes into the atmosphere. But the, it becomes an, actually an interesting question when you say, what is the fate of the peat that we extract for horticultural purposes? They use that peat for maybe six months, maybe a year. In Canada, the bulk of the peat grows in little pots. They use it in pots for petunias and for roses and all these types of things. And then what they do is that they then bury those in your gardens uh, and they're, they're right up against mineral soil. So they don't decompose the same way as they would in a natural peatland. And what decomposes and leaches out is now in contact with mineral soils, which tends to stabilize organic compounds, uh, or organic compounds. The second thing is, is that the ones that use it in, in greenhouses, which is a very large use for it, for mushrooms, for growing pot, all these types of things, they rejuvenate that peat about every six months to every year that they rejuvenate it, and they push it out back and they put them in these piles. And then they've now started using it by giving it to the farmers that are in the adjacent area. And they're plowing it into, they're plowing it in their soils because their soils are, are carbon impoverished. They, they, they want to have the water holding capacity of the peat in them. It's still pretty good peat for, for a lot of the mechanical processes. So they stick it in, they, they, they put it in there. They're also the tree nurseries are putting it all on top of their soils and using it to fortify the soils. So we started doing a fair bit of research on the rate of decomposition when you use it in greenhouses and for agricultural purposes. I have a PhD student, Bedia Sharma, that's doing a tremendous amount of work on that. And we're starting to do some sandbox experiments to figure out how much of this carbon actually might be stabilized when you mix it in with mineral soils. The early indications are is that, that about 50% of the carbon that we put into the mineral soils is stabilized for perpetuity. Well as best we can estimate it, and that the decomposition rate of that peat actually takes on the kind of decomposition rate or turnover rate that you would have in a temperate to boreal forest, which means it's about 500 years to 1,000 years now. That has a profound effect on the total carbon burden in the atmosphere versus the peatland 
and has has a profound effect. And there's even some of the simulations that are pretty perverse that we've done. The results are totally unanticipated. Is that if you put it in a permanent burial in the mineral soils and you're getting 50% burial, actually a combination of peatlands with restoration and then burying the used peat in mineral soils results in a far bigger sink than the peatland would have done on its own without restoration. Now, I am not advocating a climate solution to go out and mine peat just for the purposes of burying in mineral soils on this, but it actually has got me really thinking about our way that we're approaching things. I mean, the EU has gone berserk on peatlands, right? It's gone uh, and it's it basically it's shut down, um, shut down peat production in places. Uh, this is actually fantastic for the Canadian companies. You, you I, I, the, the EU is a bit of a hypocrite in the sense that it says you cannot, it hasn't said you can't use peat for horticultural purposes. It says you cannot extract peat in EU companies, uh, EU countries for horticultural purposes. So Canada never shipped any peat to Europe until recently. And now it's shipping peat all over the place in Europe for, for, for European producers are using it. It's shipping it to Canada or shipping it to China. And I mean, the fraction of peatlands that we're using in Canada for doing this is really, really small but they want to know their carbon footprint. They want to be able to tell the producers what the carbon footprint is and what are ways that they could do for best practices because they're doing the best practices for restoration. So they want to develop best practices for use. And that's what they're thinking about how to minimize the carbon footprint. So I think this is um, really fertile ground to do research on it. Um, I will be doing uh, probably for the rest of my career, which is not that much longer in the sense that I'm pretty close to retirement, I probably will be working on this problem to try and define it uh, and get, I'm not an agronomist, so we've got to get people that are in agronomy and these various things to look at this because the issues with the yield, with the plants that they produce and, uh, and stuff, this is tied in with the food security question. So it's a very interesting problem and not one that I've been thinking about until the last four or five years. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I'll, I'll put one more question, I'll close it down at five past, but Rory just quickly asks um, that you mentioned the significant impact of beaver, beaver behavior in yeah. managing wetlands in Canada. Is there, are there plans, you know, to encourage, or would, would that be appropriate, to encourage beaver populations as part of water wetland management systems in Canada? Uh, no. In fact, it's exactly the opposite here in Canada, because so... The beaver was almost decimated uh, in the 18th century here in Canada. Uh, we now have more beaver in North America than we probably did when the Europeans came. And the reason for that is, is that we've totally decimated all the predators for beaver. So, you know, there's not very few wolves and bear in southern parts of Canada and, and the northern parts of the United States. So in fact, beavers have become, in Canada, we're allowed to shoot beavers now because they've become a nuisance animal because their, their food stock have gone. They're taking down fence posts all over the place. It's, it's a real, it, it actually has become a serious problem. One of the ways we're solving that problem is actually shipping our beavers to you in Europe. Uh, so there's a whole reestablishment of beavers in Britain going on. In fact, I know, I know Ireland received 20 beavers from, from Canada. A uh, number of years ago, uh, that they were shipped back. They are they are actually intimately linked with uh, um, bogs and fens in the north. Uh, again, this is something that was a bit of esoteric topic that we did with a colleague of mine, Patrick Krill, uh, when we were on the Boris experiment in uh, 1994. We proposed to go out and look at beaver ponds and see what their emissions were to the atmosphere and. It was very funny reading the reviews because they thought that uh, one reviewer, in fact, said, I think that uh, Professor Ruley and uh, Professor uh, uh, Krill uh, spent too much of their time in the 60s uh, to be proposing this idea. Um, but, but it turns out that 1% of the landscape of the boreal forest is in beaver ponds, and it returns 50% of the carbon fixed in the forests to the atmosphere. And the thing that's really important about it is that it 
returns an awful lot of it in the form of methane, far more than the wetlands do themselves. And so they are, they are globally significant players in the boreal forest carbon dynamics, even though they represent 1% of the landscape. And that's the same with peatland. Peatlands only represent 3% of the, the global terrestrial landscape, but they're globally significant players because of, in this case, the density of carbon that they store. The beavers is because they increase the turnover time of carbon dramatically. So yeah, no, they are, they are uh, there's a lot of literature on beavers now um, and, the European, you need to think about this when you're actually importing beavers back into Europe about what they do, but they, they also are extremely important in the creation of wetland areas. They're uh, extremely important in North America. The evidence is clear on that. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, well, um, yeah, thank you again for a really engaging and uh, uh, comprehensive talk. And again, just kind of goes to show the you know central importance of peatlands, but also why they're so, uh, I guess interesting in in all of the kind of intersecting dimensions and factors but um yeah thank you for joining us and uh uh for the audience we'll say please join us again this time next week for um i will be joined by uh dr jenny stevens who'll be presenting the talk diversifying power advancing energy democracy and climate justice with anti-racist feminist leadership um so yeah thanks for joining everybody thanks very much